the inside flag. <laughs> it's something that I see recommended in books and videos about climbing quite often, and yet I rarely use it myself. Not never, but just rarely. I've been increasingly aware of this and I thought that I should make a video specifically on the inside flag. I do think that if you overuse the inside flag, it can get in the way of learning footwork techniques that are far more important and you'll need far more often. I don't think that using the inside flag all that much will help you to reach higher levels in climbing, but it's obviously critical that you know what to do instead and in this video we're going to sort that out. The inside flag is just where you cross the counterbalancing foot on the inside of the leg that's on the foothold before you actually make the move. If you're not clear on the three main jobs that this counterbalancing foot should do, I made a whole video on that and you could watch that one next. But one of the main points I made in that video was that often climbers place the counterbalancing foot too low and too close to the center line. And that is one of the things that's on the benefit side of the ledger with respect to the inside flag. A back flag generally works better when your foothold is higher up and therefore you have more space to get that counterbalancing foot behind the foothold leg to generate the inward leverage that you need. By contrast, the inside flag is more useful when your foothold is lower down and you've got more space to place the counterbalancing foot on the inside. You can see if I try to back flag here, in order to get the foot far enough out to the side to be useful, I need to drop down but now I can't reach the hole I'm going to. If I place it on the inside, I can get it far enough out and still make the reach. So I've just shown you an inside flag and a back flag method of doing this move. There is of course the third way, the outside flag, where I would swap feet, counterbalance with the right foot, and then do the reach like this. And in most cases, that would be my preferred way to do that move. There are some times where the inside flag is very useful and we'll get to some examples in a minute. But first of all, what are the downsides of the inside flag? The main downside in my view is that an inside flag can put more load on your fingers. An inside flag is often presented as a way to make climbing more efficient because it requires fewer or sometimes requires fewer moves. For instance, if I'm in this position and I want to reach that hold, I can do so without needing to swap feet, I just cross the foot over. That may reduce the total number of moves you have to make, but we have to consider all inputs to movement efficiency, not just the number of moves. And the load that's placed on your fingers is kind of a big deal. If that results in a greater amount of force on the handhold, then that introduces an inefficiency to be traded off against that. And that may not matter so much if you're on a big jug. And often when you see people trying inside flags and saying that they feel that it helps them and it makes the moves easier, it's often when they're on easy joggy climbing wall routes. If you then move to a hold that's much smaller and poorer, just to make this fair, I think I'm gonna add another hold. So here's a 10 millimeter edge to make the point. So why would an inside flag increase force on the handhold? And I think the answer is likely due to the change in body position relative to swapping feet and doing an outside flag. So if we just compare this position and look at the position of my left leg and how it is relative to the foothold, I'm kind of forming a hook with my leg like this, a hook in. You'll recall from my counterbalancing foot video that with the, the foothold leg, I'm not only just standing up on this foothold, I'm also trying to pull my body in. And in order to do that, I'm trying to pull the foothold directly out of the wall. So I'm trying to generate this outward force. And the muscles across the whole sling across the back of my leg, my glutes, my hamstrings, and my calves are basically designed to do just that. They're designed to pull very hard. And so if I swap feet, I can really pull in and nail my weight right in against the wall while I do the move and hold my center of mass very close to the wall. By contrast, if you look at the shape of my body as I do an inside flag, can you see that my right leg has to kind of come in across my center line? So my body is now forming this sort of bow shape. So the, the line goes from my foot, it comes out through that hip and then back into my center of mass. So compared with an outside flag, if I do an inside flag, it's a little bit more difficult for me to generate that outward pull on the foothold. And so I have to do that instead with my arm. Now on a massive in-cut jog like this, 
it may make very little difference and I might not even notice it. And that's why I think people who are climbing on a big juggy in cut holes like this might do an inside flag and go, oh, this technique works really well. However, <laughs> change that to a small hole and I think all bets are off. Now I reckon I can't do the move statically off this 10 millimeter edge. Let's just try it the way I would normally do it if I was climbing through this and I'll need to slap. So you can see I wasn't strong enough to just statically lock that edge. I wonder if I can even do it with an outside flag. I think it's not gonna happen. <laughs> no way, Just I just can't, not, not even close. I'm gonna try that again. <laughs> I just can't even initiate the move. What if I actually use a closer hold so that I can get more support? <laughs> Not even close. Let's just try that with the side flag. Yeah, that's better. And then let's go back to that yellow hold I was trying initially. Pretty hard that way, but I can do it. So hopefully that illustrates the difference. When you use a, a handhold that's much poorer and much closer to your limit, it's the amount of force that's on the handhold that's really the deal breaker about whether you succeed or fail on the move. And let's say there was 10, 20, 30 of these moves in a row, then that inefficiency would very quickly add up to success or failure. So this stuff really matters. The other detail that I want to draw your attention to is the difference between moves that are done statically or dynamically. So I, again, if I come back to the jug, I'm doing this move basically statically, no matter which method I use, inside or outside flag. <coughs> but with the small hold, I'm having to totally slap for that hold. I'm having to do it dynamically. And in the case of dynamic moves, the preparation and execution of the move gets a bit more complex. As I prepare to do the move, I get into the position, I do this, then I twist, and then I statically reach. And I do a little bit more movement as I'm actually reaching but it's just static. Whereas if I'm going to do it off this edge, I have to stay low because if I go too high on that hold, again, it's, I have to pull with more force and I can't do that. With the outside flag, um, with this left leg on the foothold, I'm in a better position to explode off the foot to get the dynamic movement to the next hold. If I'm on the outside flag and my leg is having to come out in this bow shape that I was talking about, it's a, a lot harder for me to explode off the hold in an upward direction in the plane of the wall. I'm going to tend to be, if I'm going to explode dynamically, it's going to be in that direction. Imagine if I had to dyno straight up like that. <laughs> it's really difficult. Whereas if I was on the inside uh, foot, I could easily jump a lot further. So that's just one more reason why if you're climbing on poorer holds, often the outside flag, putting your inside foot on the foothold, will tend to be easier. And an inside flag is gonna to tend to hamper you for, for hard moves. And that's why I don't tend to use it very often. There is of course another scenario, which is that you don't just have the one foothold and you maybe have another one. Let's say you had one here that's on the same line. So rather than swapping feet and doing an outside flag to reach this hold, I would cross the foot through to that one an outside flag, and that actually makes the move even easier. That probably wouldn't work for the small hold because this foothold is just a bit too high. It would still be easier to swap feet on the lower one. And again, I want to emphasize the point that swapping feet, if you can do it properly, and I made a whole video on this, that it should be relatively effortless. So you could see from a moment ago, it's really desperate for me to do that big move off this edge. But actually swapping feet on the foothold comparatively is not that difficult. So if I start here, doing the foot swap is not hard compared to the actual move. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and one point that climbers often pick up on is that although you don't often see an inside flag in normal climbing, so to speak, you do see it in competitions. And that is true, especially in boulder competitions. But there's something that we've got to remember here. Competitions are about splitting up competitors and 
Introducing unusual moves is one <laughs> important tactic that root setters will use in order to actually achieve this. And you'll often see uh, commentators picking up on that because it's an unusual move and because that's interesting to see how the root setters have managed to split the competitors by catching climbers out by using techniques that they wouldn't use all that often and so may forget to use. <laughs> so competitions are kind of an unusual case within climbing, but even within comps, one useful exercise is just to sit down and watch leading competitions. And if you get a bit of paper and sit and count the number of inside flags, outside flags and back flags, then that will be a good way to illustrate how often these different techniques are used. And you'll find that climbers are quite often doing a back flag, even more often doing an outside flag and pretty rarely doing an inside flag. One situation where they would use it is actually on the easy moves and that comes back to what I was saying earlier about drugs because in that scenario, the quickness of doing the inside flag may outweigh um, any increase in force, but if it's on a big jug, there may not be any increase in force. And that's where you get into the sweet spot where it becomes useful. So here's an example. Let's find an undercut, a pretty good positive undercut. So let's say I've just climbed up to this undercut and the footholds are kind of small, but the, the handholds are quite in cut. So I could either, let's say I've got to do a clip right here. So I could either do a foot swap like that, do a clip, come back onto the undercut and then swap back and then continue the sequence. So in that case, the foot swap actually took a fair bit of work, especially because I was holding on to undercuts. So there's a lot of weight driving through my feet. That might be a scenario when I would do an inside flag. So if I just try that, I could do inside flag, clip, and then carry on with the sequence. And that would be pretty quick. And the reason that would work is because there was not much cost to doing the inside flag on good handholds. So although it's not used all that often, the inside flag is occasionally absolutely the way to do a move. And I'd like to briefly go through two examples that stick in my memory. The first is notable because this move really matters. It's the last move of Lexicon in the Lake District. If you've not seen my video of it, I'll link to it. And the footage here is of Neil Gresham on the first descent from Alistair Lee's excellent Brit Rock series. The move to that right hand slot is the crux. And it's also where you move out of range of the gear, which is a long way below. There are two more moves to go and you're effectively soloing them. You've climbed an 8B plus to get here and you're pumped and you're scared. And if you fall, you're probably going to die. So the stakes are pretty high. You take the undercut, you stand up and Neil does an inside flag to reach the finishing jug. It's very quick, it saves a foot change in this very serious position, and the move is to grab a jug. It really looks like the right way for Neil to do this move. However, when I tried the moves, although I could easily do this move either with an inside flag or a foot swap, I preferred the foot swap. I spent a fair bit of time getting this move absolutely dialed because of the seriousness of it on the lead. It was unquestionably easier for me to do a fiddly foot shuffle because although it took more time, the move ultimately took far less strength to do it that way and I was certain that I could do it even if I was completely powered out on lead. In this case, I think we were both right in our choices. It's just a slightly different move for Neil and myself given our different heights and although the inside flag nearly worked for me on this move, it still wasn't the right choice and I came down slightly on the side of the foot swap. One climb where an inside flag made a huge difference for me was a very famous boulder problem called New Baseline in Magic Wood. This was one of my first V14 repeats and it was a climb that I'd wanted to do for a long time. The crux is the very first move pulling on from a crouch position while hanging a pretty poor crimp on the edge of the crack. The foothold is not far below the level of the handhold and the geometry just doesn't work all that well to do an outside flag. Almost everyone back flags this move, but I didn't. <laughs> I tried to do that, but I was struggling a bit to do the move consistently. I had a notion to try it with an inside flag and it worked extremely well and I could static the move almost straight away. Note that this breaks the normal scenario where you would use an inside flag. The foothold leg is quite bunched up and this would normally suit a back flag, but the rock just curves away from you and so it's difficult to exert inward pressure with the flagging foot if you back flag. 
the inside flag helped me to sit on my foot as well as forcing my upper body down and inwards under the crimp and that, that made it feel slightly less sloping. So this example is a good one to re-emphasize that although there are general patterns in climbing movement, you'll always find exceptions and only experience and judgment of experimenting with climbing movement for a long time will help you recognize those. In my case, the times that I've used an inside flag are so rare that I remember almost every occasion when I've used it on hard climbs. And remember that these are climbs that I've projected and I've systematically tried the possibilities for each move. So if there had been more useful inside flags out there, I do feel like I would have found them. So do be aware of the inside flag. It can be a useful technique on occasion, but don't overuse it and certainly don't allow it to perpetuate a bad habit and technique such as an aversion to swapping feet because that's a technique that you're going to need far more often in climbing. In this video I mentioned that I'd already made other videos with detailed breakdowns about what the counterbalancing foot should do and also how to swap feet and if you haven't seen those then you could watch those now. I've also been talking about jugs in this episode. There are a lot of them in climbing walls and they're great but they can also be the source of some bad habits in climbing technique that can really stunt your progress as a climber. More on that in another episode on the way and do subscribe to make sure you see that but for now we'll see you in the next one.